support independent radio 94.1 FM so we can remain vigilant as always. And you are listening to 94.1 KPFA and 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online at kpfa.org. The time is 1 p.m. Stay tuned next for Project Censored. Welcome to the Project Censored Show. I'm your host, Mickey Huff, in studio with Chase Palmieri. On today's program, we look at the state of the news media. We'll hear from Craig Aaron, president of FreePress.net, about their latest campaigns fighting big media consolidation at the FCC, including on matters of net neutrality and spearheading initiatives to revive local journalism. In the second half of the show, we're joined by Jesse Franzblau, policy analyst with Open the Government Coalition, discussing recent and ongoing attacks on journalists and the free press. Stay with us. About criminal minds, political ties, habitualized alibis, skies, and other guys, democracy, politics, and the apocalypse. Got the skies looking ominous. Welcome to the Project Censored Show. I'm your host, Mickey Huff, in studio with Chase Palmieri. On today's show, we're going to spend some time speaking with Craig Aaron. Craig has led Free Press and Free Press Action Fund since 2011. And for over a decade, Craig has been a leader in major campaigns to safeguard net neutrality, stop media consolidation, oppose unchecked surveillance, defend public media, and sustain quality journalism. He's been published and has written for numerous publications, including The Guardian, Huffington Post. He's been at MSNBC, Politico. Before joining Free Press, he was an investigative reporter for Public Citizens Congress Watch. Craig Aaron, welcome to the Project Censored show. Well, thanks so much for having me. Project Censored listeners are no strangers to the work of Free Press and the great work that Free Press did on media reform conferences, going all the way back to Bob McChesney. So, uh, Craig Aaron, there are so many things that are happening in your orbit, right, in terms of media freedom, media democracy. Why don't we start out with a couple of the things that you've been doing most recently when you helped deliver somewhere in the neighborhood of 700,000 petitions to the FCC headquarters regarding the Sinclair. Claire Broadcasting and Tribune merger that now seems to maybe be on the ropes. That's the big news is that this merger is in trouble. And when I was outside the FCC with a megaphone the other day delivering those petitions, you know, I think the last thing we expected in some ways that the FCC was going to reverse course and actually block this deal. They'd been doing everything in their power to increase the skids for this deal throughout the entire Trump administration. And all of a sudden, the FCC chair, Ajit Pai, did a 180 and moved aggressively to stop it. So I'm still picking up my job before a little bit, to be honest. But I, I think this is the result of a couple factors, including all of that activism that's been going on against that deal and a lot of attention and scrutiny on Sinclair, uh, both for the great size they were threatening to be, and, of course, for their long record of airing right-wing propaganda as part of their newscast. So a lot of people are waking up to the danger of Sinclair and the possibility that they can control more than 200 television stations, local TV stations in this country. And among those pressure wasn't just coming from the left. It was also coming from the right. A lot of conservative outlets, most notably the website Newsmax, were in the, in the halls of the FCC saying, wait a minute, this is really bad for conservatives, too, because these guys are going to drown us out. As their competition. So somehow, and I'll be honest, I'm still tracking down exactly how that combination of things and you know, some added pressure from Congress and an investigation that was happening at the FCC on special favors for Sinclair have resulted in a move that 
very likely to block this deal. It's not 100% dead as we talk, but it's really close. When they do what the FCC did, which is called designating it for a hearing, it sounds sort of boring and wonky, but it's kind of like telling your kids that the family pet has gone to live on a farm. Uh-huh. Uh, <laughs> the deals right. don't come back. So it's, it's really uh, an amazing turn of events and a glimmer of hope when it comes to local media and local media ownership and, and maybe keeping a truly awful company, Sinclair, from gaining even more media power. Craig Aaron, freepress.net is one of the websites that listeners can go to and certainly want to give you a big round of applause for you and your colleagues at Free Press. You've really been on the front lines of these struggles, but it's also the case the hundreds of thousands of petitions indicate the FCC is aware of this as well, whether Ajit Pai cares is another matter, but this has been a, an issue that has united right and left, this issue against consolidation. So there's a really high percentage of the population that really doesn't want more corporate media mergers. Is is that right? Yeah, I totally agree with that. And that's been such an interesting thing. And, and you're right to note, I mean, over the years, over the last 15 years or so that I've been working on these media ownership issues, we've always had these strange bed fellow alliances. Brent Lott, former senator from Mississippi, was someone who was a strong opponent of media consolidation. And I think for a lot of people, for most Americans, there is a distrust of big, powerful media companies. These are companies that like to sort of wrap themselves in the First Amendment. They like to say that, oh, all they're doing is good in journalism. But people's experience of big media companies is very different. And they're, they're very suspicious of too much media power in too few hands. And, and, and I think we've seen that time again, even in this incredibly challenging administration, doing you know truly awful things every day. On these issues of media power, there are interesting alliances to be made because most people really distrust this kind of concentrated corporate power. And that's not just true in the media. That's true in all kinds of industries. And, and, and people feel it. They feel what happens when you, when you have so much power concentrated in such few hands. I mean, this is journalist jobs disappearing. This is, they're watching their local newspapers and local TV stations, you know, do less and less coverage of what's happening in their communities. And it's not like the good old days for corporate media, as you guys know well, were all that good but we're entering dangerous new territory. And when you've got a company like Sinclair that has no interest in serving local communities, all their money and advantages come from consolidating cookie cutter content, pushing that on all their stations. And then they throw in the fact that they push this reactionary agenda, forcing stations to run right-wing commentaries. I'm sure many of your listeners saw this video of all the local anchors being forced to give this sort of double speak presentation on fake news it was really unbelievable but in in the context of this campaign that was a huge breakthrough moment because look Sinclair has not been a household name and even when the New York Times does a front page story and Mother Jones does an in-depth investigation that wasn't enough to break through but Deadspin the sports website which has actually become quite an interesting site when it comes to media commentary cut this video up of all the anchors talking in unison and it really drove home for people what was at stake and 30 million people, I think, watched this video, and all of a sudden, we were talking about Sinclair, not just like an ABC affiliate here and a Fox affiliate there. And and, and I think that really did hurt them in making their case before the FCC, in that they were being so brazen in how they were flouting the rules, setting up shell companies to sort of game the system to get under those, those congressionally mandated limits on how much one company can own. And they thought, because they were essentially operating as a propaganda arm for Donald Trump, that all would be fine and they would get their deal done. And I'll be honest, I thought, because they were actually operating as a propaganda arm for Donald Trump, that they would get their deal done. But they didn't. You alluded to this earlier about Ajit Pai. I'm a little more cynical, I guess, than that. I'm suspecting that there's something else going on, some other series of interests in a bigger picture. Do you have any insights on that? The background is this, this deal became a lot more politically toxic because of all of the problems that Sinclair had and people were paying attention. You also had the FCC chair himself under investigation and congressional scrutiny. So he has some personal stake in the outcome here. But a big part of the story is other conservative media outlets going to the FCC, going to the administration. Newsmax is sort of the one on the record. And Chris Ruddy, who runs that site, golfs with Donald Trump. And he did not want this deal to go through. And he was able to push a lot of conservative voices. And Tom DeLay, the former Republican majority leader was writing op-eds against this deal. So there was conservative pushback 
And where I think it gets interesting and maybe feeds into your well-earned cynicism is who else on the corporate side was, was in the background there also pushing buttons. Is Rupert Murdoch someone who's saying, well, you know, I'd like all these rules to change so I can buy more stations, but maybe I don't want Sinclair to get this big. The big cable companies have a stake in not seeing Sinclair get so big because they got to negotiate with them over local rates and how much it's going to cost to carry the local broadcasters. So there were some corporate interests. They were pretty quiet. And, and I think at one point in this fight, they had given up. But when the when the political opening happened again and Sinclair started to be in trouble, I think the knives came out from some of the other companies behind the scenes. But I'm still waiting for the real inside scoop to be written up and someone to, to nail down this story of exactly how a G-Pi went from the Sinclair's best friend to their worst nightmare in a matter of days. I mean, it was <laughs> everything for Sinclair up until the day he announced that he was going the other way. And when they went the other way, they went hard. So, Craig, I want to give our listeners a sense of who the decision makers are when these issues are brought up. Is it really the case that Ajit Pai can decide by himself one way or the other what goes through and what doesn't? Or are there more decision makers that we aren't seeing? Well, it's a little more complicated than that. I mean, for the Federal Communications Commission, they're in charge of broadcast television licenses. So the, so the way they get an inroads here is that they have to sign off on any TV license being transferred to somebody else. And it does take a majority vote of the commission to do that. So there are normally five members. There's currently only four because one of the Democrats left. So there are currently three Republicans, one Democrat on the commission. And as the chairman, you have a lot of power. You get to set the agenda. You decide when there's going to be a vote on an issue. And for the most part, whatever Ajit Pai says, his two Republican colleagues follow. I mean, I will admit that when he decided to go against Sinclair, they both looked very confused <laughs> and, you know, we kind of couldn't believe that this was happening, but ultimately they did vote with the chair. There are others. The Justice Department was playing a role here. They could have gotten in front of this deal. There was pretty narrow terms on which they could have done it. They were clearly not satisfied with what some of Sinclair was doing, and all of this is operating in a larger political vortex. So, you know, it's not like Donald Trump isn't giving necessarily direct orders to a G5, but it's pretty easy for the White House and other powerful figures to say, hey, just weighing in here, here's what we think you should do. And, and so I imagine there was some of that going on as well. But those of us have been following this closely, like I say, we're really surprised at this turn of events. And I think the same could be said for Sinclair and Tribune. They were pretty shocked themselves. We're speaking with Craig Aaron of Free Press. You can learn more at freepress.net. And there's a lot of great information on their website. That's why I want to make sure listeners are going there. Freepress.net. And uh, also Free Press Action Fund. Is that a separate site? No, it's, you can still get all the information at freepress.net. Free Press Action Fund is our 5014 arm, which allows us to do direct advocacy. You also do a lot of work on privacy and surveillance and also net neutrality. So there's definitely been a lot going on these past years and certainly in the past couple of months, even especially around privacy, surveillance, and also net neutrality. Net neutrality, obviously, a big issue. The Republican majority of the FCC voted in December to undo really strong net neutrality protections that had passed during the Obama administration. We sort of have to remind people that that was also the result of a massive public pressure campaign that pushed the then Democratic chair of the FCC to take the right position, which he eventually did, but initially was not on the right side of the issue. We got those strong rules. They were upheld in court. But a G Pi has moved aggressively to undo them. And the FCC did vote to undo them and take them off the book in December. But that's not the end of the fight. And it's not unlike Sinclair, there's been a really interesting moment of, of just a huge public breakthrough on this issue of net neutrality. Net neutrality being the simple idea that when you go online, you should be able to go wherever you want, do whatever you want, download whatever you want. And it's not up to the phone or cable company to decide which websites are going to work and which aren't. They shouldn't be allowed to favor the corporate news outlets that they own over independent news outlets or favor their movies over something you want to watch on Netflix, et cetera, et cetera. And, and this has become a huge political fight, a big issue. And, you know, one, again, that I think is really breaking through. They thought they were going to sneak these rules through and nobody would care. And the exact opposite has happened. I mean, millions of calls have poured into Capitol Hill. And there is an effort underway to undo these rules. A bill actually passed the Senate, again on bipartisan grounds, overturning what 
the FCC did in December. That bill has now moved to the House, where it faces an uphill climb, but we have 177 representatives now on the record who signed a petition to force a vote on undoing the FCC's rules. We need to get to 218, so there's still a ways to go, but a door opened recently where the first Republican crossover to support what's called the Congressional Review Act, or CRA. So it's a live issue, and I think it's one that's absolutely showing up in the midterm elections, showing up in polling like never before. So I'm increasingly optimistic that we're going to be able to undo what the FCC did, and simultaneously we're in court. We sued the FCC along with a bunch of other people over the rules that they passed, and that's a case that's likely to be heard before the end of the year. So there, there's a lot of fight still going on in the issue of net neutrality. And for listeners out there, especially if you have a Republican representative, this is the time to get in their face, let them know, let them know that you care about the free and open Internet. I think they're getting a lot of pressure, but they can always use more, especially when we're you know trying to move them to go against something that the Trump administration did. But again, this is an issue that doesn't need to follow along partisan lines. And it's one that has awakened a whole bunch of people across the internet to to get engaged in ways that I think is going to be really important for the long term. So, Craig, in theory, ending net neutrality doesn't actually affect internet users until the internet providers do, like you said, start slowing down the connection to certain websites. Have we seen the start of this? And if so, is it going to happen in little bits and pieces where they try to sneak it past us at first? I think that's right. I mean, what we've seen over, and this is an issue again that I've been you know, fighting on since 2005. And and, and while it's so hot politically, there's obviously a disincentive for these companies. You know, if they get caught violating net neutrality in a brazen manner, that's going to be a really big problem politically and a good way to get back net neutrality. So they're, they're moving slowly and cautiously, but I take them at their word. And every time they're talking at industry events where they don't think anybody's listening, when they're under oath in court, they're very clear that given this freedom, they will discriminate. That is their intent. They want to favor their own sites and services. They've said as much time and time again, and I believe them. They've been caught in the past doing just that, favoring their services, throwing up all kinds of obstacles to using technology in ways that you want as an individual, which might be different from the things they think you should be paying for or paying more for. So I think we will start to see things, and at first they probably will be behind the scenes, and that's one of the real dangers here is that you might go online, you're trying to download the podcast of this show, and it's not loading. You're getting that spinning wheel of death, and you're saying, like, well, what's going on here? Maybe I need to, maybe there's something wrong with my, my connection, and you call them, and they probably will sell you up to a higher tier, uh, you know, or whatever they can get away with. But they've been caught numerous times in the past interfering with those connections. And it only takes a few seconds, a small amount of favoring their own content to give them a huge advantage. You know, there are so many things out there now. You know, we all know in our own internet usage, if the site doesn't load, we go somewhere else. And if they can feed that other somewhere else, make it their content, the things that they own, that gives them a huge, huge advantage. It's a form of censorship. Yeah, no question about it. We talk about net neutrality as the First Amendment issue of the internet because it it is that kind of that behind-the-scenes power. I mean, if you sort of imagine everybody's in a big race for, for attention and eyeballs, and these guys own the track. And they want to head start. They want to do whatever they can to favor their own content site and services and actually profit off the scarcity. You know, if they can force other companies to pay them a little extra, of course, you'll end up paying for that. They'll do that. You know, and remember, these are companies, when it, especially when it comes to news and information, Comcast owns NBC. They own MSNBC. They have an incentive to favor that content. AT&T looks like they're going to be able to merge with Time Warner. The case just got appealed. We'll see. But they're taking over CNN. So these big, powerful phone and cable companies are getting deep into the content business, deep into the news business, and they have all the incentives in the world, if it's allowed, to try to favor their own content and services. And and we know from the history of media consolidation and concentration that, you know, there's no way that independent voices like this show or Democracy Now! or anybody else is going to get a chance to compete. The The fast lane is not going to be available to them. All the advantages that the Internet work offers, they're going to go away for independent voices, communities of color, and everybody else. That's incredibly important to know, and I'm really glad that you brought it to that conclusion. We're broadcasting out of Northern California. You may know Dane Jasper. 
CEO of Sonic.net, who has been a pretty staunch defender of net neutrality. And we're fortunate enough to have that service in our backyard in Northern California in the San Francisco Bay Area. There are other companies and there are people that are pushing back and that are trying to make sure that we have diversity and we hear these viewpoints and that we don't see a slowdown of certain sites. So, so there is hope. Yeah, I absolutely think there's hope because this has become such a, a hot political issue. And, you know, when I used to go up to Capitol Hill years ago working on this, and a member of Congress would say, uh, yeah, hey, nice to see you. Yeah, 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 this seems important. Uh, am I going to be able to get money from Silicon Valley if I'm on the right side of this issue? <laughs> that used to be sort of the story that they would tell, right? But now you go up there, and, you know, the Silicon Valley companies have their own issues, and most of them have been pretty quiet. That's not the question anymore. The question is, like, you know, my kid came home from college. They're really fired up about this. Uh, every time I go home to a town meeting, somebody asks me about net neutrality. So this is breaking through on, on a political level in a whole new way. And, you know, the polls show that north of 80 percent of Americans support net neutrality. 79, 80 percent of Republicans support net neutrality. So this is a winning political issue. And that message is beginning to get through in ways that makes me think we will get a better outcome. And that's not going to come you know, the, the companies are happy to cut a deal, and the Internet companies have gotten really big, but the public is in a completely different place. And the Internet itself, I mean, Reddit, for example, has been an unbelievable source of activism on net neutrality, and, and I think that's really translating and carrying over. So we took a big loss in December, there's no question about it, but I think the political winds are, are, are shifting in the direction of the free and open Internet, and we know how important that is. You guys have studied the media as much as anyone and and you know that every time a new medium is out there you know it's oh this is going to be great and it's going to be free and open to everyone radio tv cable tv wasn't even going to have advertising and now we don't, here we are with the internet there's a lot of problems on the internet a lot of issues to work on but you know these these are just tools and they're either going to be used to liberate or oppress and we're at one of those junctures where we have to make that choice and, and net neutrality is really the first step in in reclaiming some of those tools for for all of us and I think that's why it's an issue that's really caught on with people because they understand how important that open internet has become to getting independent information, to getting their own stuff out there. And at this point, just to talking and communicating with their friends and family. I always say that, you know, the internet may not be up there with water and electricity, but at this point it ranks there right alongside hot water. Craig, I know you have to go, but I like that you reminded us of this historical context. Every time we get this new technology, new media, etc., there's hope, and then it seems to get shrunk down because of history, media historians like Bob McChesney and the work that McChesney's done with John Nichols. Victor Picard comes to mind. These are really important works, I think, that people would benefit from reading to understand the current media landscape. And I wanted to end on a, on a positive note with you, because one of the things that you have been working on has manifest in, in the world of journalism. And that is the New Jersey developments, the victory on the sure. Civic Info Bill for the Civic Information Consortium. Could you spend at least a minute or so here? Because this is such an important breakthrough. This is something that, I mean, I know $5 million for the Civic Info Bill uh, isn't going to fix everything. But this is a huge uh, move in a direction that, that, that portends to be very positive. Yeah, for folks who haven't been following, you know, we were faced with these, these questions of, you know, wh where do we find new answers for what we do about the future of journalism and you know people all across the country are watching journalists lose their jobs newspapers shrink and be shuttered and we came up with this idea uh, that we've been testing in new jersey because the state of new jersey owned some public television stations and they sold them in an auction got a couple hundred million dollars and so we went into the state where we've been doing some local organizing and said hey why don't you use some of that money to actually support local journalism and over the last couple of years We've been working with the legislature and a, and a number of universities in the state to, to come up with this idea we call the New Jersey Civic Information Consortium. And the basic idea is that we're taking $5 million in state money that was just approved to create a fund that would actually support local journalism projects, civic technology projects. And, you know, what we envision and are hoping to see actually happen in the state is a fund that other philanthropists could come in and support. Hopefully the state will supported even more once the proof of concept is there that could actually provide money independent of advertising to support innovative and local projects. And the way we're trying to build it is that the requirement is that these universities that are part of the consortium have to have local partners looking for projects that really emphasize underserved communities, communities that have been left behind by the mainstream media. And this is an, an innovative way to start to answer this question of when corporate media isn't providing what we need, when they're giving us Sinclair, when they're decimating the newsroom, how do we begin to build alternatives? And we've seen, again, maybe a surprising amount of support 
on the political level for trying this idea. And if it works in New Jersey, this is the kind of thing we want to take to other states to begin to say, hey, let's reinvent this media system. Let's start rethinking how we support and sustain media, public media, and, and look for alternative ways to fund this because the ways we've been doing it for the last hundred years just don't seem to be viable well, Craig Aaron, I would love to continue this conversation with you some point in the future, particularly where this overlaps with Project Censored's campus affiliate program, our critical media literacy pedagogy, and uh, our our ongoing support for community radio, community media, and investigative journalism. I was, uh, again, very heartened to see the developments uh, take place in New Jersey, and kudos to Free Press for, for really helping make that happen. Uh, well, fantastic. Uh, appreciate that. And yeah, let's, let's keep talking. Uh, I think, uh, you know, this is a moment out of crisis comes opportunity sometimes to begin to look at different models, new ways of doing things. And what we found in all our work across the country is that local communities are hungry for this. They don't hate the, the media. They hate how their communities have been covered <laughs> and the ways they've been miscovered and misrepresented for too long. If we actually start building at the local level, we can actually build something that was better than what we Well, Craig Aaron, thank you so much for joining us today, taking time out of your very busy schedule. If you are the president of Free Press. My pleasure. Thanks, Rob. You're listening to the Project Censored Show. I'm your host, Mickey Huff. In the next segment, we'll be joined by Jesse Franzblau, a policy analyst with Open the Government. We'll be talking about the press as alleged enemy of the people. Stay with us. Brief announcement. Later this month, KPFA's local station board will hold a town hall meeting for the KPFA community. Listeners are invited to attend and share their ideas for the station. This event will take place at the North Berkeley Senior Center located at the corner of Hearst Avenue and Martin Luther King Way. The date will be Saturday, August 18th, and the time will be 1 p.m. The North Berkeley Senior Center is six blocks from the downtown Berkeley BART station and AC Transit's 12, 51B, and 52 bus lines run nearby. Welcome back to the Project Censored Show. I'm your host, Mickey Huff, with Chase Palmieri. On this segment of the program, we will be joined by a policy analyst from OpenTheGovernment.org. Jesse Franz Blau is a policy analyst there, and they're based in Washington, D.C. Open the Government is a coalition of good and limited government groups, environmentalists, journalists, library and consumer groups, labor, and others united to make the federal government a more open place in order to ensure integrity and accountability – includes progressives, libertarians, and conservatives, and Project Censored is actually a proud partner with Open the Government. Jesse Franzblau, welcome to the Project Censored show. Okay, thanks for having me. So we're having you on today. We're talking about media issues in general. We just talked to Craig Aaron about federal communications politics and net neutrality and local journalism. And not long ago, a letter was drafted. And in fact, by the time this show airs, that should be out. And it was a letter directed to Sarah Huckabee Sanders. And it was regarding the CNN reporter. Caitlin Collins, that was ejected from the White House. She was prevented from covering a Rose Garden event. Could you tell us a little bit about what's going on around that issue? You know, Open the Government is a coalition that, that spans more than 100 organizations, and a large number of our partner organizations work on press freedoms and, and protecting media rights and freedom of expression. And so, yeah, this latest effort that we're working on, on July 25th when the White House singled out CNN reporter Caitlin Collins, barring her from attending an event at the White House Rose Garden, ostensibly because she was asking tough questions or questions that the White House didn't want to 
answer. So we have a, a demand going out calling for the White House to refrain from punishing journalists for asking tough questions. And the statement really emphasizes that an informed public and functioning functioning democracy is, is very contingent on a free press. Well, Jesse, this is certainly in American history and U.S. history in particular, despite the fact that we make claims to free press principles, there is a long history of attacks on the press, certainly coming out of the 1960s into the 1970s in the Nixon era. Then Vice President Spiro Agnew had the infamous alliteration that was penned by speechwriter William Sapphire referred to the press as, quote, nattering nabobs of negativism who formed their own 4-H club, the hope hysterical hypochondriacs of history. Of course, that preceded Nixon's 71 attack on the New York Times, the release of the Pentagon Papers, whistleblower you know, Dan Ellsberg. Nixon even went to the Supreme Court and actually lost. This is also kind of where the myth of the liberal media began. And again, in recent history, this has been weaponized in terms of the, the so-called fake news epithet. And Donald Trump on the campaign trail, as well as coming into his first and then second year in office in the presidency, it's been basically a staple, a hallmark of his uh, his administration administration, the climate he's creating. He's calling the press the enemy of the people. The heightened rhetoric is definitely particularly worrisome and, and deserves a lot of a lot of concern and attention. Earlier this year, we, we worked on a report, Open the Government released a report in March that documented the first year of the Trump administration. And we looked at a lot of the secrecy trends and abuses and threatened press freedom. Looking at the White House, Environmental Protection Agency, Justice Department, DHS, and we found that Looking back uh, over the last year, there's certainly been this fairly dramatic erosion of, of openness, crumbling of norms, frequent and ongoing disparagement of the media, efforts to stonewall information requests, manipulation of data, suppression of facts, etc. And we pulled some stories and some reflections from journalists and taken their experiences and looking at how they've encountered this increasing challenges and new obstacles to doing their job. I actually found that some journalists are adapting to new secrecy challenges, for example, by filing open record requests at the state or local level to get information that's denied by federal agencies. But, of course, if journalists who have the time and resources and the training to get information, if they're blocked from getting government information, it really, sends, really hurts hope for the average citizen to get information to hold their government officials accountable. But we interviewed journalists such as, you know, like Washington Post journalist Wes Lowry, who told us about how this administration's pledge to really go after journalists and subpoena journalists as part of their effort to crack down on leaks, in addition to the White House's posture towards the media, definitely is having an increasing chilling effect on officials who might otherwise speak more openly to journalists. And, you know, noting that, of course, the last administration, the Obama administration, was widely known and widely criticized by media rights groups for aggressively pursuing national security leaks and going after journalist sources and and going after whistleblowers. But this environment is, in, is increasingly worse for journalists now, and we're seeing that it's more difficult for journalists. So, Jesse, in the case of this particular CNN reporter, Caitlin Collins, who was banned from this Rose Garden presentation, is that because of a certain line of questioning that she had done previously, or is that really just a response to CNN's attitude towards Trump as a whole? It's hard to tell. It appears to be... A combination of both, but this is obviously part of this broader trend that, that everyone is really seeing and everyone is noticing. And I think the intent of having a large statement of a broad coalition of groups across the country really saying that this is not not right. So we're speaking with Jesse Franzblau, a policy analyst at Open the Government. You can learn more about this coalition of various organizations, including Project Censored. You can learn about Open the Government at openthegovernment.org. We're talking right now about the free press as enemy of the people. This is a phrase that has been used over and over again by Trump on the campaign trail, Trump the president and his administration. And of course, this goes hand in hand with the weaponization of the term fake news. Trump surrogates actually used this attack on the press as a key talking point throughout the first hundred days in office as Trump routinely takes to Twitter. One of the more infamous examples, he wrote, the fake news media failing New York Times, NBC News, ABC, NBC, CNN is not my enemy. It's the enemy of the people. 
And of course, that term enemy of the people carries significant historical connotations, right? Jesse, it's been used historically by despots against journalists and dissidents, sometimes even used to justify ethnic cleansing, whether it's World War One or two, particularly Nazi Germany, it was referred to as the Lügenpresse or the lying press. And so this is a very dangerous kind of precedent that Trump is going down here. And can you tell us what exactly is the substance of the letter that's being directed to the White House about these attacks against journalists? The substance is essentially calling on the White House to to not use its power to block journalists from access because they're asking hard-hitting questions or because they're asking uncomfortable questions or because They represent an outlet that is critical of the administration. And it makes clear that the press is the really core front line against creeping authoritarianism, a creeping overreach of government authority and abuse. And looking at how this rhetoric is used since the campaign trail to this administration and and how it's fused down to cabinet-level positions and, and into the agencies, you know, a few other case examples that we captured in this report that I mentioned earlier that folks can find on our website looks at some journalists who, who discuss how they've attended industry conferences, for example, where immigration and customs enforcement officials, where the acting director in one case was openly, harshly criticizing reporters and, and lambasting them for their reporting on the government's immigration enforcement practices, calling their reporting misleading and repeating a lot of the rhetoric the president's rhetoric about spreading fake news and really feeding their own disinformation campaign to counter what journalists are reporting on or attempting to report on. That's a, a very dangerous thing. So, Jesse, I think we all have a sense of how language like enemy of the people is harmful to our First Amendment. But I'm wondering if you can speak at all to how Trump is maybe setting a precedent for how other foreign leaders are dealing with the journalists in those countries. The general sentiment that journalists are somehow a threat to the country or to the government institutions in power turns the kind of threat on journalists. And it certainly encourages other governments to to take measures to carry out acts to to block journalists, to monitor journalists, and to, to carry out threats against journalists. You know, and I think, as you see how it fuses down, you see the the Attorney General and others in this administration going after leakers in a very aggressive way, creating a very heightened sense of danger for any would-be whistleblowers. Now this chills truth-telling and really signifies that corruption and fraud and illegality goes unstopped and and unpunished. And it certainly fuses to, to other countries in terms of where the U.S. may have been somewhat of a check on its allies. I'd like to remind listeners that you're tuned to the Project Censored show. I'm your host, Mickey Huff, in studio with Chase Palmieri. Today on the program, we've been devoting the hour to freedom of the press issues. Earlier, we spoke with Craig Allen of Free Press about net neutrality and local journalism issues and so forth. Right now, we're speaking with Jesse Franzblau, a policy analyst for Open the Government, which is a coalition of environmentalists, journalists, library and consumer groups, labor and others united to make the federal government a more open place in order to ensure integrity and accountability. We're focusing on free press issues today and a letter that is being drafted and by the time this show airs the letter will likely be out and delivered it is to the white house and sarah huckabee sanders regarding the white house expulsion or banning of the cnn reporter caitlin collins from covering a rose garden event we're speaking about press freedom issues or actually lack of press freedom issues manifest from the trump administration and his long anti-press rhetoric referring to the press as enemy of the people in fact if you go back and look in the campaign you'll see many references to trump's attacking of the press as being enemy of the people or lugan press or lying press and how he has weaponized the phrase fake news to apply to any news reporting that he doesn't like or doesn't agree with. Jesse Franzblau, your organization, uh, Coalition, is pushing back, fighting back, and in this letter, you're basically saying an informed public and functioning democracy is contingent 
on a free press. And the undersigned, many organizations, including Project Censored, has signed on, says we demand the White House refrain from punishing journalists for asking tough questions and instead welcome all credentialed reporters to the events where the press are admitted. So I want to ask you about that last part. In the era of blogs and citizen journalists and so forth, what's your position or what's your view or what are some of your thoughts about, quote, credentialed journalists? And does this imply that people that don't have credentials are not journalists? And what about outlets like RT, where reporters were forced to register with the Department of Justice as foreign agents? In terms of the second part, journalists having to register as foreign agents, it's definitely a matter of concern. I mean, look, look at the U.S. outlets that operate all over the world that receive government funding. If you force every journalist in a foreign country reporting for an outlet that the U.S. is funded, you know, to the same standard that, that in the U.S., they, you run into a lot of trouble. Right. Well, so it wasn't long ago here also that A.G. Sulzberger, publisher of the New York Times, had a meeting with President Trump discussing, as Trump put it on Twitter, the vast amounts of fake news being put out by news media and so forth. Sulzberger, of course, shot back saying that he was deeply troubled by the anti-press rhetoric. Also, Sulzberger claimed he told the president directly that he thought his language was not just divisive, but increasingly dangerous. And so I have another question on top of that. I think here's part of the problem with the term fake news. The people that wield the term usually do so as weapons to deflect questions they don't want to hear. But it is the case historically that the New York Times and the Washington Post, they're known as being propagandist and cheerleaders for U.S. foreign policy. Remember that the New York Times cheerled us into the Iraq war in 2003 on a pack of Judy Miller's poor reporting. And some might even claim lies, but it was certainly false reporting. So I think the conundrum here is that while Sulzberger's statements seem to mirror those of open the government in terms of support a free press. It's also the case that the, the corporate media in particular, they don't necessarily seem to be held to account. So they open themselves up to being vulnerable to these kinds of ad hominem attacks from the Trump administration. What do you think about that, Jesse Franzblau? The example of the lead up to the Iraq war and, and the type of reporting that was happening there and, and, and looking at how government officials were deliberatively leaking information to, you know, on Sunday shows, and then when the New York Times reported on it, would show that up as evidence of the agenda that they're trying to push. Media outlets, and yeah, particularly the biggest media outlets, need to be held to the highest standards and heavily scrutinized for reporting, and when they do make mistakes, own up to that. And the New York Times and other outlets have put in measures into place to, you know, ensure that they don't have one source reporting and that they have multiple sources, and it's verifiably, you know, checked, and, and a lot of that, particularly with the New York Times came after the Iraq war reporting, it's a huge component of freedom of expression and media rights that media outlets themselves have to be very well scrutinized and, and very meticulous about their reporting. Well, it's also the case, Jesse Franzbaugh, that these attacks on the press coming from the Trump administration, it seems that they have had connections to real-life attacks taking place against journalists, right, in, in the real world. For example, we saw in 2017, GOP candidate in Montana, Greg Gianforte, confronted a Guardian reporter, Ben Jacobs, and actually body slammed him and threw him to the ground. Ultimately, he admitted his guilt to it, but he still went on to win the special election to the House, despite the fact that he assaulted a reporter and had to pay out money to pro-free press organizations. And again, even more recently, we saw the attacks on journalists where there were murders. What do you see in terms of this, this connection with these attacks on the press and real-life violence being meted out on journalists? It's quite alarming. Every word really counts. The rhetoric turns into reality. They aren't just words without potential harm. And yeah, particularly as you see lessons in other countries and this very systematic attack and violence against journalists in Mexico, for example, where the U.S. is a very close ally and supplies a lot of security assistance and a lot of intelligence monitoring assistance to, and to that country. And seeing this trend of in the U.S., the rhetoric turned towards direct violence against journalists is quite chilling and obviously has a very dramatic um, chilling effect. But yet you have the, the journalist profession actually seems to have many more people, especially young people, wanting to engage in it, which is also inspiring um, investigator journalists and, and independent journalists. 
And at Project Censored, we've been championing independent voices and independent journalism and a free press since 1976, the non-corporate kind of journalism. Uh, that is, of course, what led me to the question about whether or not journalists are credentialed and who makes those kinds of, of definitions. By the way, I wanted to be more specific for our listeners just to remind them. It was over a month ago in June 28 that Jared Ramis stands accused of killing journalists in Annapolis, Maryland at the office of the Capitol Gazette. And in fact, the county's deputy police chief characterized those shootings as a, quote, targeted attack. And again, that's that's what sort of led me to ask you that specific question. And I think also that really is putting even more on the line with this letter that Open the Government has out. So that makes this a very, very serious time. And one would hope that a combination of people like Salzberger at the Times and the massive coalition of Open the Government, that perhaps the Trump administration may be amenable to really thinking about the kind of rhetoric that it uses regarding the press. Maybe that sounds like a tall order, Jesse Franz Blau, but how do you think that's going to play out? This letter that we're working on is part of the broader trend, and I think we're really trying to get a grasp and kind of fully document and understand the broader trend in terms of the attacks against journalists and the attacks against would-be whistleblowers and journalist sources that really takes away the, the public's access to information. So again, kind of make these broad demands, bringing groups together across the country saying, this is not right. This is not part of a supposedly functioning democracy, you know, which is contingent on a free press. So, Jesse Franzblau, you mentioned whistleblowers a couple times, and I just wanted to chime in here briefly. Chase Palmieri wants to jump back into the conversation with us. Um, but it's also, I want to remind listeners that J- July 30 was National Whistleblowers Day. And in Washington, D.C., the National Whistleblower Summit for Civil and Human Rights was held. And listeners can learn more at the whistleblowersummit.com. Project Censored has been a longtime supporter and sponsor of the Whistleblower Summit. And, of course, as you mentioned several times, Jesse Franzblau, whistleblowers often are key sources for journalists that get them the information to try to report on the things that are really going on. Uh, Chase Palmieri? So, Jesse, as a researcher and policy analyst working at Open the Gov, uh, obviously what you're trying to do is protect some of the current existing legislation around the First Amendment and freedom of the press. But I'm wondering, are there any new policies that you are all trying to enact? Maybe anything new that has come into effect because of the Internet? Any new type of protections? There's a new effort to get stronger protections for journalists, particularly against plot suits, against the, you know, this kind of suing a journalist that, that takes place. You know, there are different efforts, legislative efforts, try to get stronger protections at the federal and the state level for journalists. We also work a lot on pieces of legislation to increase access information, so working on Freedom of Information Act reform to try to increase the ability of journalists and the larger public to get access to information that's really critical for public understanding of policy making and for communities to have tools, to have the access to information needed to understand what's happening in their communities, to have information needed to understand how law enforcement are are acting in in their communities and the type of tools that they're using to monitor and survey communities and, and the type of technology that they're using to monitor social organizing and political dissent. So those are some of the different types of reforms that we push a lot on the access to information side, because that's obviously a key component for, for journalists to be able to do their job is having access to the information needed to, to inform the public. And did you recently see Glenn Greenwald's article on Julian Assange? Have you been following this issue? A bit. I think one concerning aspect around the, the, the WikiLeaks case and the case of Julian Assange is the kind of using this case to further attack whistleblowers. So you have members of the Intelligence Committee working to push through legislation to basically use WikiLeaks as this example of a media outlet being a foreign agent and giving the government greater authority to go after these outlets. The broad nature of language like that, of putting that into legislation and, and codifying that is, is, is very chilling. Let's not forget Julian Assange made available the Chelsea Manning video of the war crimes being committed in Iraq that have never been followed up upon. Of course, since then, we've seen many other whistleblowers come under attack, whether it's Thomas Drake, Manning, Edward Snowden, and now Reality Winner. Long list of attacks on whistleblowers here, which again is why I mentioned that whistleblower summit. 
so the Assange case is, is almost sort of like uh, the pinnacle there of sort of shooting the messenger. And remember, there were high-ranking officials in the Obama administration and the CIA that out and out called for the assassination of Assange. I mean, that's quite troubling. It's completely troubling. And it's important to look from the perspective of a lot of the groups we work with, a lot of the organizations that the information that comes to light through whistleblowers As you mentioned, this attack in the messenger type of tactic that immediately happens after there is a major disclosure in the case of Reality Winner, we've seen immediate attack against her for releasing this information, even though the information that's come out has actually led to pretty important public disclosures about if the NSA analysis is is correct about the threats, um, you know, to the election system, to to local election uh, offices. And he's seen just because of that leak direct changes that local officials have made to their election system because because of the vulnerabilities that and so you can make a very strong argument that that type of information is very much in the public interest. Jesse, my understanding is that Julian Assange and Edward Snowden have not been willing to come back to the United States to face trial because they're worried about being prosecuted under the Espionage Act. Is your organization doing anything around the Espionage Act and maybe making it so that that will not be a problem for whistleblowers in the future? A lot of our partner organizations work a lot on that. And the big thing that Edward Snowden consistently says and, and that others say is that the Espionage Act really doesn't have a public defense aspect. And so if Snowden were to come back, there would be no opportunity to to publicly defend the information that's been exposed and defend how what he exposed was intended to shed light on waste, fraud, and abuse. So there's no chance to look at what these information disclosures have critically changed. They've made it possible for some very essential reforms to surveillance and and, and limitations on bulk surveillance um, collection programs that arguably would not have happened if it weren't for those disclosures. Jesse Franz, Blau, uh, OpenTheGovernment.org. I have one more question for you before we have to wrap up. We started talking about the recent White House attacks on a reporter from CNN. Of course, the attacks on the press have been broad from the White House, but this was very targeted. I had a question about this because the statement that is in support of free press that's coming here in the wake of the recent White House attacks that talks about how the press needs to be unfettered, the job of the press is to ask powerful questions. How does that jive, in your opinion, with what seems to be a contradictory statement dating back to the Michelle Wolf incident at the White House Correspondents' Dinner? The White House Correspondents Association response to the Michelle Wolf incident was that they were actually critical of her. While they claimed that they have commitment to a vigorous and free press, they also talked about honoring civility and not to divide people, right? Well, the very case of being a journalist at times, the act of asking the tough questions is in itself a divisive act. So it seems as though there's some contradictory message perhaps coming out of the White House Correspondents Association, given their great support for what's happening now with the Trump administration attacks on the press. Sure, I think in the White House Correspondents Association and dinner, I think can be, I think it's seen by a lot of freedom of the press groups as being this kind of cozy affair, or emblematic of sometimes this cozy affair between journalists and government officials, which is obviously nothing new, but in this time of attacks against and against journalists by the administration, this cozy relationship. Would you argue that it's equally troubling the pressure put on reporters from foundations or well-heeled nonprofits or not just coming from the government, but coming from corporate media or others that try to silence reporters? In other words, there should be one standard, right? Yeah, I mean, you look at what James Risen wrote a lot about in terms of what happened with the New York Times kind of acquiescing to the government demands over reporting of warrantless surveillance happening in 2004 that the New York Times, several instances, agreed not to report because the government said don't do it. And looking back at, I think, that type of historical understanding of what questioning that, why a major news outlet didn't stand up to the government, and how often is that happening again and again. And as, as you identify the White House Correspondents Association type of statement there, I think, can be seen as kind of emblematic of this, again, this complacency or acquiescence of government demands on 
controlling what the what the media says or does not say. Well, Jesse Franzblau, over at Project Censored, we think Open the Government has it right. And we're, of course, proud to support the letter calling for press freedom and calling for the White House to refrain from punishing journalists simply for doing their job. And by the way, I'd like to remind listeners that OpenTheGovernment.org does many, many, many things, and it's a very broad coalition, and it transcends partisan lines, including progressives, libertarians, and conservatives. We've been speaking with policy analyst Jesse Franzblau. And Jesse Franzblau, I want to thank you so much for the work you do, and thank you for joining us on the Project Censored Show today. Keep up the good work. Thank you. Me too. Supporting human conditions, not free market propaganda and corrupt politicians. Cause they own by special interest groups that fund their campaign. That does it for another episode of the Project Censored Show. Our listeners who are interested in reading a recent op ed that Andy Lee Roth, the associate director of Project Censored, and myself did called Championing Reality, takes a look at Trump's attacks on the press. You can learn more about that article at projectcensored.org. The Project Censored Show was established in 2010 by myself and Peter Phillips. I'm your host and executive producer. Anthony Fest is our senior producer. Our associate producers are Dennis Murphy and Mitch Scorza. To learn more about Project Censored, go to projectcensored.org. The Project Censored Show airs on over 40 stations around the United States, from Maui to New York. And all of our shows are archived online at projectcensored.org. Please feel free to contact us as well through our website for feedback or ideas for future programs. Please follow, like us on Facebook and other social media. Thanks for listening. We'll see you next time. Up next, Tara Verde. Got the skies like an ominous. So the ocean burn bright with waves full of poison. Genocide wars fall for little poison. The weapons manufacture pay for by attacks on the bridges and the levees and the mines collapsing. All the prisons, those are capacity citizens. And the times when a master thief can buy and conquer, steal a masterpiece. Open your eyes and realize what's happening. Time's running out to reach all potential vein. At the table, then you're probably on the menu. We got that love with the brothers and our sisters. In 1989, Spike Lee made a film that spoke truth to power. It's called Do the Right Thing, and its message and urban aesthetic echoes today as gentrification resonates through our neighborhoods. The film takes place on the hottest day of the year in Bedford-Stuyvesant section of Brooklyn, where everyone's frustrations smolder and build until it explodes into violence. Boycott sound! Go! Yo, boycott sound! I got your boycott swing. Boycott sound! Join KPFA and our partner, the New Parkway Theater in Oakland, Saturday, August 25th at 3 p.m. for the groundbreaking film, Do the Right Thing. Director Spike Lee's powerful portrait of urban racial tensions features an ensemble cast that includes Danny Aiello, Ruby D, John Turturro, Rosie Perez, and Samuel L. Jackson. Get your tickets today at the New Parkway Theater on 24th Street in Oakland or online at kpfa.org. KPFA Summer Fun Drive is over. Unfortunately, we fell well short of our goal. If you can help us make up some of that shortfall, please go right now to kpfa.org to pledge your support. Our thank you gifts are still available. No donation is too small. Online, kpfa.org to support independent radio 94.1 FM so we can remain vigilant as always. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz and online worldwide at kpfa.org.